right. The first thing I'm hoping is that I'm more successful with this thing than so far. Um, so to briefly put this into perspective, I first traveled to Syria in 1997, at the beginning of my PhD studies. And after that, I sort of lived there on and off until the outbreak of the war. My last visit was in the autumn of 2010. During that time, I uh, founded and was involved with two archaeological projects, one being Dermaliana Sharki, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. And I had just completed my first season of work at the citadel of Zalabie on the Euphrates when the war curtailed any further exploration of, of that site. Um, I find it quite hard to explain exactly what I do because I'm currently in a theology department, I've studied art history, I've been an archaeologist, so I just like to say I work on late antique Syria. It's simpler that way. So to, to start off, building slightly on what John was saying earlier, I wanted to point out that these problems were not unknown before the war. Obviously, it's a question of scale, but Syria had always had a problem with the looting of antiquities. The weak points have traditionally been the borders with Turkey and with Lebanon. Even as a young PhD student, I encountered someone who told me how much you got for a square meter for looted mosaic. Monochrome and geometric being cheapest, polychrome with figurative imagery being many times a power to the times 10 more. Um, it is an ongoing problem. All you had to do was know a friendly border guard and know who to give the bakshish to, and you had a very good trade. In the immediate aftermath of the war, or the year or two before the war, there was an ongoing issue where the Department of Antiquities were engaged in a battle to stop widespread looting in the site of Amrit in particular, right on the, the border with, with Lebanon, a major Phoenician town, and they weren't actually doing very well because the people doing the looting were closely uh, associated with the al-Assad clan. So you can see that this was a really entrenched problem. And when I started my work in Zalabie in 2010, the local directorate general of antiquities had a brand new head who was very minor because immediately before me starting, it had been discovered that in the Muhafazat of Raqqa and Deir Azur, the two regional bosses, had been clearing out the stores of the, monast of the um, museums and selling stuff they thought no one would notice on the black market. So they'd done a root and branch getting rid of everyone down to a very low level in these provinces, and we're trying to get it back to normal. So I'm just highlighting that, as I say, these were not new issues. In some cases, the smuggling networks and the mentality was there before the war, and what we're seeing is an acceleration of entrenched behavior. Um, and just quickly, going back, I should probably point out, this is Deir Ezzur, and this is Raqqa province. And of course, these will be recognizable to everyone as the two provinces that are the stronghold of IS right now. So we have a major difficulty in Syria in reporting the damage. And that's because um, Syria is fragmented. It's fragmented between so many different parties. We don't know exactly what's going on where. It changes on a day-to-day -day basis. Different parties have different attitudes towards antiquities. They have different priorities. And this map was taken from a BBC website dated the 28th of September. Now, the white bits are ostensibly areas that no one in particular is in control of. They're largely desert, but you know, these lines change on a daily basis. So we can't have, at any one time, a 100% accurate view as to what's going on in Syria. Also, damage is reported in different ways in different regions. Idlib province has perhaps the strongest network of FSA-affiliated fighters still out there, and they interact with members of the Department of Antiquity in exile, so we can assume a fairly accurate level of reporting on destruction and looting in that area. But if we contrast this with Daesh territory, 
Well, they released the information as propaganda, and as John said in his paper, we know what they want to tell us. We have no way of getting really accurate information from on the ground unless people who make it out can report back to us. Or sometimes there are these reports from these very brave citizen journalists that manage to get an internet connection and, manage to, and can disseminate some information. So anything I'm going to say here is obviously going to be partial because we just can't say anything about Syria right now with 100% accuracy. So because it's so huge and I only have 25 minutes, what I have done is to try and look at different categories of destruction that are going on in Syria right now and to see if we can quantify or try and interpret patterns in different processes. So the first category, I would say, is targeted or accidental. We can't be sure. These are sites that are on the front line of a battle, or they're sites that have always had a defensive purpose, and it's questionable as to whether they were deliberately targeted or whether they genuinely were caught in the crossfire. And in this, we would include the Umayyad Mosque in Aleppo, with the tragic destruction of the minaret in particular. And here we have the courtyard of Crac de Chevalier, where the tracery, the Gothic tracery, all the details have been destroyed as it got caught in a battle between different forces. As I say, according to who you listen to, some people would say this is completely accidental. Our soldiers just happened to be hiding there, and then they came under fire. Others would say there's been a policy of putting soldiers in historic monuments as a, a deliberate act of provocation, maybe to draw the fire of other groups to get them condemned. I am not going to get drawn into all the different debates around that right now, but that is one area of destruction that we're, we're dealing with. Next one, obvious one, is category, um, second category is looting. The most famous image, I think, and this has been all over the press, is what is happening in Apamea. This one was taken from this date, 2011. This was taken to 2014. Now, you can see Afamia had only been slightly, it's a huge site, it had only been partially excavated. This is over a kilometer long, so you can see it would have needed a huge effort to excavate this entire city, which is ro largely Roman. Its decline, quite topical this, came about with the Persian invasion at the beginning of the seventh century, from which it never recovered. Um, its walls were completely dismantled so that when the Arab armies arrived, that was, it just went into a slow decline. And um, there wasn't much excavation or looting at the beginning of war. By last year, it was like a, a surface of the moon. Now, this, again, is Idlib province. And people I've spoken to who are part of the Department of Antiquities outside the country refuse to condemn this because they say people are starving. Um, with looting, we have targeted looting by criminal gangs. We have IS-linked looting. But we also do have low-level looting, which is desperate people who are internally displaced. Over half the Syrian civilian population is displaced. They have no way of feeding their children. And so in Syrian society, there tends to be amongst many people in the Department of Antiquities an attitude of sympathy towards those carrying out low-level looting. It, it's not cut and dried. Um, yeah, so as I've said, it can be done to finance terrorist activities. It can just be a criminal network. It can be linked to drugs running, um, other types of criminality, money laundering. And verbal testimony suggests that regions such as Idlib, as I've just said, a lot of it is done by desperate civilians who cannot access NGO resources. This image is taken from a website, um, the Association for the Protection of Syrian Archaeology, by a group of, uh, it's a group of Syrian archaeologists in exile in France. And they have a very good website trying to look at it regionally. And this is a haul of art articles taken from Syria that were recovered on the black market in Gaziantep, just across the border in southeast Turkey. Just to give an illustration, this is just one small hoard found at one time in one town. 
Um, the next, we move on to something that is the preserve of, of Daesh, the deliberate act of destruction and complete erasure. And this, of course, is where we come across Palmyra. We have here the images of Temple of Bel before its destruction and afterwards where it seems from the images that all we have is the monumental gateway to the cellar still standing. Um, on this side, we have the Temple of Baal Shemin. Again, the cellar was pretty much perfect, just missing its roof. And after its destruction, there was nothing as far as we can tell. Again, you can't verify this because there's no one on the ground who can get a, a valid report out at the moment. Um, my own site, where I lived for a number of years, Dermalian Rishaki in Karyatane, this was again completely destroyed, but they destroyed the ancient monastery. They did not destroy the brand new church right next to it. They took out the church bells, they took all books, Bibles, prayer books, they cleared out the monastery library, sorry, um, but they left the modern church itself standing. And talking to, to friends from Karyatane, apparently they do have their very own warped internal logic as to what is permissible and what isn't. And in this case, it seems to have been particularly the bones of the saint that they were offended by, not least because this was a jewel shrine, and at least since the 15th century, Maelian had been venerated as Sheikh Ahmed Hori, Sheikh Ahmed the priest, by the local Sunni Muslim population. And that seems to have been as much an issue as the fact it was a Christian monastery. So, um, if we have differing patterns of destruction, when we're looking at Daesh, can we underline, a, and can we discern any underlying reason for this? Is there any logic? Are we just trying to project a logical view onto madmen? Well, um, as Dr. Al Gailani mentioned earlier, the Sufis have been amongst those who suffered the most. This is the Sufi shrine of Sheikh Isa Abdul Qadir al Rafai near Busaira. And thus far, as, as far as we can quantify it, it seems that more Muslim shrines are being destroyed than Christian ones because outside the Khabul region, the Hasake region, generally there are very few Christians in the area held as a percentage of the population by IS, um, Daesh. They generally, the larger Christian populations are urban and they're further to the west of the country. So there are just pockets of Christian villages and Christian population around Hasake, but generally we're talking about very small percentage of the overall population. So it, it's quite hard to kind of build up a picture of what they do if they got hold of somewhere like Aleppo, which before the war was 30% Christian. Um, shrines, as, as I say, especially Sunni shrines have been destroyed, and also Sunni graveyards. From friends from Karyatein, the Syrian Orthodox Cemetery and the Sunni cemetery were both destroyed when Daesh came to town because they were on either side of the, the main road leading north to Palmyra. The Syrian Catholic monastery was behind cement walls. It wasn't on show. That was left untouched. So it seems that you know things out of sight, out of mind, might just get away with it. But if they're seen as too prominent, they get rid of them. And the reason always given to the local population is that it's a form of shirk. It's polytheistic. They, they say it's superstition, it's not Islamic. That was apparently the justification given to the Kurwani when their, their cemeteries were destroyed. When we get to Palmyra, um, the evidence is more complex. There was a staggered flow of information coming out, though. And this, I think, might be significant. This is a picture um, I took a while ago of the Temple of Baal Shemin. First, we had the destruction of the Temple of Baal Shemin being confirmed. And what people didn't talk about openly was that, um, although it was perfectly preserved, it didn't have any sculpture, nothing that could be taken away and, and flogged on the open market. It was beautiful. It had beautifully carved lintels, but nothing figurative, nothing geometric or foliate. So it didn't have stuff that could be kind of prized out and taken away. Unlike the Temple of Bell, and the entrance to the Temple of Bell had these beautiful reliefs amongst two, they're just two of many, and had a lot of material that theoretically 
could have been taken away. And there was definitely a delay. You know, we had the very dramatic pictures of the Temple of Baal Shemi. Then it was almost a week, if I remember rightly, before the news started to filter out about the Temple of Bell. And you have to start thinking about this. They are valuable commodities to private collectors. You can't sell them on the open market, but if you're the kind of person who just enjoys having them for your, your personal private enjoyment, that you can gloat that you, you own this thing, then they are extremely attractive. And it has been suggested um, to me by someone that perhaps wealthy supporters, maybe in the Gulf, we could maybe say someone, I don't know, in Central Asia, wherever, who has sympathy might take receipt of some of these objects in return for resources, for armaments. You don't have a paper trail. You don't have money changing hands if you send a consignment and it's an exchange economy. Because this pattern recurs also with the most lavishly decorated tomb towers. Um, one of the first ones that it was announced had gone was the Tower of Elachbel, which looked like this. And, you know, I, I don't think it's too far-fetched to suggest that delay could have been while teams are taking these things out. Because once the thing has been blown sky high and there's only rubble left, who's to say whether reliefs were in there or not when it was blown up? And I think it's too simplistic to always assume that there's money in this equation and that we can do it through following paper trails. If someone's got a load of, of bullets or <laughs> guns, I think you know, going to a friendly border and doing an exchange is entirely feasible. In this context, we can see destruction as a mechanism being specifically used to facilitate looting and to hide the traces. Because more and more evidence is coming out that looting is licensed in Daesh territory. You can pay for permits to take a bulldozer. This is um, an American security group managed to get hold of this permit, which actually authorizes someone to go and bulldoze a particular site in their territory. It's actually a legalized form of making money in Daesh territory now. And I think knowing that, this makes the whole idea of targeted looting and then complete destruction to hide your traces more and more feasible. So um, this means that there is a framework being set up. Almost they'd like us to believe it's a state. But I wouldn't go that far. But you know, there's a bureaucracy of sorts being set up to facilitate a network of looting in IS territory. Elsewhere, oh, maybe other areas under government control, under um, FSA or various different groups. I think it's more on an opportunist, opportunist basis with people perhaps looting to survive because they don't have any money to feed themselves or pay for medical care and so on. Evidence does suggest, both done by journalists in this country, by um, archaeologists, by a whole network of different groups, that there is a large network of middlemen in Turkey facilitating the onward journey of looted items. I think that can almost certainly be said of Lebanon as well. And, you know, we've got to the ridiculous state that coins like this one from Apamea are appearing on eBay. Um, once they reach the West, we have no idea who looted them. It could be an innocent, starving villager, but it could be someone who had one of those IS permits. So anything that we buy that isn't securely provenanced is potentially, quite likely, funding terrorism. You know, this is a, a real issue. So what can we do? Um, and I will be wrapping up very shortly. Um, <laughs> pretty obvious, but I know so many people get tempted. Don't buy, authenticate if you're an academic, or otherwise engage with anyone offering unprovenanced items of Middle Eastern origin. I mean, we say it till we're blue in the face, but it doesn't get listened to. People still think, oh, that's a bit of a bargain. And, and you know, they're tempted and they go ahead with these things. Um, I think there needs to be more pressure on the art market to really take self-regulation to new heights and improve record keeping, um, ask for more provenance from different groups. I think also in this country, we can specifically coordinate new initiatives through the, UNI the new UNESCO Chair in Cultural Property Protection and Peace, Peter Stone, who's taking up his post in the spring, 
because his, his brief is really to, to try and, and get people to coordinate, to stop replication of work, to, to try and target resources more efficiently to where they can do the most good. And to move forward from simply recording and mapping damage to work with Syrian, and I think we can open that here to Iraqi, to, to Libyan, to Yemeni, and you know, all the different groups we're talking about today, with professionals from those areas to ask them what they need in terms of support for strategies in um, working on protection and rehabilitation of monuments when such a thing becomes possible. And I think we also, again, this is UK-based, we need to keep up pressure on the government. They've recently, with great fanfare, launched their all-party parliamentary group for the protection of cultural heritage. And they're promising money to help these different strategies. They've given the first lot, three million to the British Museum to train Iraqi professionals over a five-year period. But we need to see more action than that. We need to make sure that instead of just talking about things, they actually try and act. And I think I've done it in 20 minutes to allow for questions, as you asked. <laughs>